I'm here today with Michael Spence, Nobel Laureate and Professor of Economics at the Stern School of Business at New York University. We're here to talk about his book, The Next Convergence, The Future of Economic Growth in a Multi-Speed World. Mike, thanks for joining us. Great to be here, Rob. So, the next convergence. Convergence between whom and who, who, who's converging here? <laughs> I think that what I intended was that the developing countries are, and, and a massive number, hundreds of millions, billions of people are, are in the process over a century of converging to uh, income levels and lifestyles like those that we enjoy in the uh, advanced or industrialized countries. And when would you start that process? Was it uh, the 1940s after World War II? I when? think the best starting point is, is shortly after World War II. Uh, the GATT opened up the... Uh, the global economy, you know, the the mistakes of the post World War One period were, you know, so bad that the leaders, with with American uh, leaders in in the lead, so to speak, that we decided not to do that again. Technology provided, in terms of connectivity and logistics and travel and the internet and so on, provided a huge tailwind, and but most importantly, the colonial empires fell apart. And so the built-in asymmetries that had sort of characterized the differences between the advanced countries and colonial powers on the one hand and the folks that lived in the 85% of the world's population that lived yes. in the countries that we then called uh, undeveloped or underdeveloped or something, uh, took us a while to get to developing. But, but I think that's the starting point. And where are we now in the, uh, in the scheme of things? It's a journey we haven't completed, uh, but we've got you know, a pretty good grip. So it's a kind of midterm report on how we're doing a little more than a halfway through that century. We have the, the future economic giants at, in the sustained high growth category now, India and China. You know, nobody can predict the future with lethal accuracy, so nobody can say nothing will go wrong. But, but it looks like it will go from 15% uh, of the world's population that's relatively rich and lives well to something on the order of 80, 85 percent, and maybe more if things go well. So I remember you ran the uh, World Bank's Growth Commission, and I would guess that this book is informed by many of the insights that that group uh, derived in, in attention to structure. Yeah, no, that's exactly right. So w w in the World Bank group was a, a, a commission called the Commission on Growth and Development. I had the privilege of chairing it, but fortunately most of its members, unlike me, uh, were you know, political and policy leaders from a wide array of developing countries who'd, who'd fought the battles, won and lost, learned a tremendous amount both from their thinking and their experience. And I just learned a lot from them and I thought a book that in part set out to try to describe the sort of dynamics, including the microeconomic dynamics of this kind of high-speed sustained growth that we now see uniquely in the post-war period in the developing world, m might be of interest to a wide audience, both in the developing countries and, and, and in the advanced countries. And especially in the advanced countries, Rob, I thought that understanding that now that these countries are becoming fairly large and impactful, systemically important, yeah. I guess is the way we would describe it in other contexts, including impacts on us, on our structure, on our income distributions, and so on. It, it might be a timely uh, opportunity to try to put some structure around that. So the first part of this book really tries to describe the dynamics and tries to describe what governments do to support that dynamics. It's not a different growth model in the sense that the private sector is the dynamic engine. You know, it is market and capitalist incentives and entrepreneurship and, and Schumpeterian creative destruction and entry and exit and the best win and so on that drives this process. But the government has a pretty important role as maintainer of stability in the macroeconomic sense, as investor in key assets that include human capital and infrastructure, and in, and in trying to overcome certain kinds of market failures that tend to characterize economies whose market and regulatory institutions are underdeveloped. Mm -hmm. And so there's a pragmatic, sensible kind of supportive role um, that goes along with governments. Yeah, at some level, in, this. Uh, in the mature economies, academic economics assumes institutions that are efficient and functional, whereas I would imagine from uh, prolonged study 
of the developing economies, you, you really become much more sensitive to those structures and how much they matter to the outcomes and the possibilities. The underlying structures that we presume are in place when we build those models are, are, are actually in this process of being developed in the developing world. So policy making in, the, in successful developing countries has a somewhat experimental characteristic mm. to it. You know, we're not really sure. We're a little bit skeptical. We'll try it if we can and see if it works. Uh, that kind of, it's, a, it's more of almost a business mindset in a way.